Uh, our speaker today is, is Jeff Kinehart. Okay, um, today um, I've been asked and we're going to talk about um, seed saving. Uh, it's something that uh, has obviously been practiced for long before we had seed companies. It's an old practice. Uh, has kind of fallen fallen out of vogue uh, by a lot of gardeners, uh, simply because in many cases uh, seed can be purchased relatively cheaply. Um, but there's a lot of other reasons why we might be interested in saving seed aside from just economics. So, um, oh, I guess a little bit of background about myself. Um, I work for the University of Illinois. I work down at the Dixon Springs Ag Center, which is an ag experiment station located 30 miles north of Paducah, Kentucky. And um, right now we are south of all of the bad weather, so we're sitting in a pretty good place. So with that, if we can go to the next slide. What are some reasons why we might save seed? Probably the most common reason that we see right now are people who are wanting to preserve heirloom cultivars. I think in the course of the last uh, 10 years, and especially the last five, there has been a great resurgence of interest in heirloom varieties, and particularly in some crops like tomatoes. And a lot of the heirloom varieties had a much different appearance and much different flavor than is available in um, varieties that are commonly used in commercial production at this point. And because of that, uh, there's a lot of people who uh, have interest in, in once they get an heirloom established at their place, they have interest in maintaining that line and so they will save their own seed uh, from season to season and uh, ensure that they have availability to it. One of the things that we see is that seed companies uh, are, are just that. They're companies and their objective is to make money and there are a lot of varieties that they simply don't sell enough unit of seed of to justify continued production and so many of the varieties that used to be commonly grown are no longer available in the nursery trade and I think people are worried that, that can happen again and so in many cases they're maintaining uh, their own lines of these heirloom varieties. Uh, another reason commonly touted is saving money and, and although it is true that some of the modern hybrid varieties uh, of tomato for example cost as much as a dollar a seed and in some cases I've actually bought some that was a dollar twenty five a seed uh, that's not normally true in terms of the price for the types of varieties the open pollinated varieties that we're talking about I'm not sure that you want to go through this exercise simply to save money although there are lots of other good reasons to do it like preserving, preserving germplasm and cultivars that you particularly like. Another reason that we see individuals saving seed is to develop new cultivars and there are in fact people in this state that are hobby plant breeders and if you are a hobby uh, plant breeder then you know after you've made your crosses you have to save your own seed and plant it out the following year to see whether or not you are successful or, or not. And uh, I had a professor at Eastern when I was doing my uh, bachelor's degree in botany who was uh, quite an avid breeder of daylilies and he would make lots and lots of crosses and set out the resultant seedlings the following spring and grow them for two years and see what did or didn't work. Um, hobby plant breeding could almost be another one of these um, webinar series that we do at some point in the future. Okay. Um, so developing new cultivars is another reason, you know, or hobby plant breeding is another one. There is some element of fun and or satisfaction uh, from, from uh, keeping things from generation to generation and that's another reason why people might save seeds. And, and lastly, which I think is among the most common of the people that I have talked with, worked with, uh, is saving plant varieties for sentimental reasons this is the tomato that grandpa grew or uh, it's really common with ornamental plants which some of them can also have seed saved as well but you know this is the four o'clocks that uh, used to be in my uh, grandma's flower bed outside her front window and so sentimental value is another reason why we might save seed. Can we go to the next slide? Okay seed saving which is also known as brown bagging works very well with 
most open pollinated cultivars. And the reason that it's sometimes referred to as brown bagging, or not sometimes, commonly referred to as brown bagging, uh, that goes back to largely soybeans. Uh, farmers would take their seed that they had harvested in the fall, and most of it they sold, but some of it they would take to a seed cleaner and have it, um, they'd have all the splits cleaned out so that they only had whole round seeds and they would have weed seed and such cleaned out of it at the seed cleaners and then the seed cleaner would in turn always put that seed into 50 pound brown bags like feed sacks and so uh, when you save your own seed it's oftentimes referred to as brown bagging and that's kind of what that goes back to. I did want to spend a little bit of time during this talking about that sometimes the seed saving we, we really are talking about things, or we could be talking about things that are not really seed, but it would also, I think, fall underneath the same line of thought. And those would be things that would be vegetatively propagated, and they could include things like uh, potatoes, horseradish, sweet potatoes, strawberries, garlic cloves, or garlic, I'm sorry, walking onions, and daffodils. And on the on the bulb side of thing, daffodils is another one that's very common that we've seen people save, uh, oftentimes for sentimental reasons. This is the same daffodil that grew at Grandma's house, and daffodils work great. You dig them up, you split them apart, and you do division, and you can move them around anywhere. Uh, and it's kind of an example of seed saving as well. Next slide, please. Strawberries are something that's really easy to propagate and keep same lines of, and they are kind of automatically come with this little unit, this daughter plant that forms, and it can be pinned down and allowed to root in the garden, and then you can dig that resulting plant up and move it, and you can keep your plantings fresh and new uh, just by simply propagating new beds. Next slide, please. Garlic is another example, and garlic, we do it for uh, multiple reasons. One, it, there's a lot of heirloom garlic varieties that are difficult to find in the trade, and there's a lot of garlic that people grow that really doesn't have any variety name, but it's just been the garlic that has always been in some individual's family, and so the only way you can get more of that particular strain of garlic uh, is by saving back seed uh, garlic cloves and replanting them the following year. Next slide. And in German families, uh, this is a picture of horseradish, and it could also be saved from year to year simply by breaking off the small root using that seed piece um, to grow the crop the following season. Next slide. And and lastly on the list of pictures that I have for these, uh, you know, vegetative kinds of things, but I think still fall within the auspices of seed saving would be sweet potato and, and you know this is something everybody quite frankly should do with their kids or grandkids but you know you can take a sweet potato and and set it in water and you'll start to have sprouts occur you pull those sprouts or those slips off and allow them to root and then you take them out to the garden once the danger of frost has passed and voila you've got a sweet potato plant next slide please Commercially, that's really kind of the same way we do it. The only difference is that commercially, when we're trying to establish sweet potatoes, we will always start with the potato that you see in the bottom right-hand corner that was set in the hotbed that you see in the upper left corner. That potato, that sweet potato, was bought as seed stock, and it has been indexed for virus and other diseases so that we know that we're having clean and healthy plant material. One of the dangers that we get into with saving varieties, whether they're from seed or from, you know, garlic cloves or strawberry runners, one of the problems that we can get into is the accumulation of disease. And when we save these varieties from year to year to year, uh, we can wind up with, and particularly on the vegetatively propagated things like we have been talking about, we can wind up with a pretty substantial accumulation of um, typically viral disease, although occasionally also uh, can be problems that are bacterial in nature. And you know, at that point, you know, once that has happened, and this used to be commonplace back 
back through probably the 1960s, but growers would simply stop using the variety and they would refer to it as the variety had run out. And what that meant was the variety had enough disease load on it or in it that it was no longer uh, of significant vigor or performed in such a fashion that it was viable for production in either a commercial or a home garden setting. And so that is one of the dangers that we can run into is, is this accumulation of uh, disease problems and something that we have to try to be diligent and avoid. Next slide. Okay, now let's talk about seed proper. And in terms of seed proper and saving, saving seeds, we're going to have to have just a few slides that uh, discuss genetics. The vegetatively propagated things that we had been talking about uh, almost always result in an exact clone of the parent. The genetics are almost always exactly the same as the mother plant uh, that uh, was used and it will perform in a fashion similar to the mother plant. Next slide please. But in the case of seed, seed is the result normally of sexual reproduction. That is to say that it's polynuclei combining with an egg or a seed nuclei. The resulting individual will be genetically one half the same as the mother plant and genetically one half the same as the father plant. And so we have to guard against uh, the formation of, um, or we have to guard against cross pollination if we're trying to preserve a specific heirloom variety or if we're trying to do hobby breeding and make our own varieties and we have to have controlled cross-pollination um, so that we know what the source of the genetics of the father material was. And we always know the source of the genetics of the mother material because that's where we're going to take the seed from, um, but we have to guard with where the source of the uh, pollen was coming from. Next slide, please. In the case of a, a tomato plant, there are almost 35,000 protein coding genes in a tomato plant. So there are lots of different little pieces of genetic information that are contained within a tomato plant. Next slide, please. And if you'll remember back to high school biology, and don't worry, don't roll your eyes too much. We're not going to spend very much time on this kind of stuff. But if you remember, we can represent uh, we have a contribution of genetics from the mother and from the father and we call those the alleles. And if you look in the upper case, you can see that we have homozygous alleles. We have big R, big R mother cross with big R, big R father. And in that case, all the resulting offspring wind up being genetically identical to the parent. This is what we're hoping for when we save seed uh, in the typical scenario is that typically hoping that if we started with Brandywine tomato, when we save our seed and we plant it out next year, we still have, in fact, Brandywine tomato. And in the case of some crops, like tomato, uh, that are normally self-pollinated, this is pretty easy to do with varieties that are, um, have had successive generations of open pollination. If you start to look at the next example down on the same slide, where we have one parent that is heterozygous for a trait, a big W and a little w, you can see that the genetics and the resulting offspring are only 50% genetically the same as the mother, and 50% would be genetically different. If you're doing plant breeding, that could be a good thing. We might enjoy the uh, increased vigor that might be afforded by this hybrid cross, but if you're looking for saving seed, then we would be looking at 50% of the seed that we saved is really an off type and not what we were looking for uh, and was not part of our goal when we set down this path to save seed. In these cases, we're really only looking at one gene. Go to the next slide, please. When we start looking at two different genes, which you see in this example right here, we're looking for the gene for uh, seed color and also pod color. If you'll look in this, and, and you'll just have to trust me on this, but there are a much smaller fraction, only 25 percent, 
wind up being genetically the same as the parent. And we're, at this point, we're only looking at two genes. Remember, we said in a tomato plant, there's about 35,000 genes. So when we go about doing this, we have to be careful that we don't have cross-pollination and that we are using open-pollinated lines that are stable and capable of uh, being handled in this fashion that we're going to to save seed. Next slide, please. Seeds from hybrid parents, they can be saved. A lot of times you'll hear people say, well, you can't save seed from hybrids. You absolutely can save seed from hybrids. The problem is that the offspring that result, um, there's going to be great variability, and very small percent of them are going to actually be like the parent plant that you had saved the seed from. I would guess if most of you are avid gardeners, you have had cases where you had only beefsteak tomatoes in the garden, but you had a tomato seedling come up, and an awful lot of the time that tomato seedling that was from last year's tomato will wind up resulting in the production of a cherry tomato rather than the production of a beefsteak tomato, and that was because the beefsteak that you had planted was hybrid, and again, when we save seed from hybrids, um, whether on purpose or by accident, in the case of uh, the example I'm giving you, um, there's going to be a great deal of variability in, in what we get back from that plant material. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to save seed, and if we're going to save seed, that seed is going to be formed in the ovary, and so we have to talk a little bit about flowers as they exist in the plant world. In this particular case, you're looking at a perfect flower, and a perfect flower is one that has both male and female parts on a single flower. The male parts consist of, or it's called the, uh, the stamen, and it consists of the anther and the filament. The female part is called the pistil. It consists of the stigma, the style, and the ovary. Uh, just for fun, how many of you guys are avid cooks? Of those of you that are, um, you may have at some point used or eaten a product uh, or, or a dish that was made with saffron. And if you were not aware of this, saffron comes by collecting the male flower parts, the anther and filament, from crocus plants. It's very expensive, but it's also very good. Um, but that's where that particular uh, spice comes from, is by collecting male stamens uh, from crocus flowers. It's very expensive because it's very tedious work to get uh, very many of those things, and even after you have a whole bunch of them together, they still don't really weigh anything. So, at any rate, that's kind of a sidebar. You're looking at this perfect flower here with its male and female flower parts, and in this particular case, the flower is not only perfect, but in this example, it's also considered a complete flower because it has both petals and sepals. Uh, we can have cases where we have both male and female flower parts so that it's perfect, but the flower is incomplete because it doesn't have either petals or sepals. Uh, the question is, any crocus or only certain ones? Um, my understanding is the stuff that is worth really, really big money is, in fact, a specific variety of crocus. Next slide, please. Okay, we looked at a perfect flower before, and there are also examples in the world of imperfect flowers where we have uh, male flower parts in one flower and only female flower parts on the other. This is a pumpkin plant that you're looking at here. The male flower is on the left, and the female flower is on the right. You can see the great big ovary that will ultimately become the pumpkin if it becomes fertilized on that slide on the right. And if you look, in this case, the ovary is actually below where the other flower parts attach. And that is referred to as an inferior ovary. It's not as common as superior ovary, where the ovary lies above the other flower parts, is most common. Um, but, but both kinds do exist. So we had perfect flowers have both male and female parts in one place, in one flower. Imperfect flowers have separate male and female flowers. Next slide, please. And the last thing that we need to talk about is monoecious versus dioecious plants. Monoecious are plants where it literally the translation of monoecious means one house. So even though a plant like a pumpkin 
has separate male and female flower parts, both of those flower parts will appear on a single individual plant. So it is still monoecious, even though it's got separate male and female flower parts. There are examples of dioecious where we have male and female individuals of plant material. In the food crops world, the, the most common example that I could think of, if anyone has ever raised hardy kiwi, which is this vine that really makes much smaller fruit than the kiwi that you buy at the store, but it will make fruit. On hardy kiwi, you have got to have one male plant. If you do not, you'll never actually harvest any kiwi because they have separate male and female uh, flower parts. There are lots of other examples, but most of them tend to be ornamental. Uh, we have a lot of people, for example, who will grow uh, American hollies, and they'll be worried about why they never have any of the beautiful red berries. Well, that can happen for two reasons. It could be that they have a male holly tree, which males don't ever get red berries on it, or it could be that they have a female flower tree, but they don't have any males nearby to provide pollen, and without the ovary being pollinated, the red fruit will never wind up developing. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's a little bit about terminology. Let's talk about what are some of our considerations for saving seed. One should be seed purity. We would like to be uh, twofold. We would like to do our job in such a fashion that the seed we produce is pure. And in order to do that, we also need to make sure that the seed we start with is pure. Another consideration that we need to worry about is considerations for gene pool. We would like to collect seed from more than a single plant, and we would like to collect it uh, only from those that are true to type, very similar to the parent plant. And when we talk about gene pool, um, this is something that I think is intuitively a little bit difficult. If you go out to your garden and you're going to save seed from, and again, for our example, let's just go back and use brandywine tomato again, but we're going to save seed from our brandywine tomatoes, and we have got 10 of them all here in a row, and as we look at these 10, let's say it was from last year and it was a droughty year. As we look at those 10, four of them are much, much uh, more vigorous than the other six. We really shouldn't just save seed from only the four that are the most vigorous. And the reason for that is this. If you were to do that, you will start changing the genetics of the, you could potentially start changing the genetics you have selected for those that are perform best under drought conditions. While one would think that, well, obviously that would be something great and we would always want to have that kind of plant, well, what happens when the following year it's one that's really, really wet? And you may find out that because you selected from only those plants that were very drought tolerant, you wound up putting selection pressure and you may have lost something that was good. So in order to keep a uh, deep, if you will, gene pool within this variety, we would like to collect from several different plants, making sure that each one is true to type. So we worry about seed purity and we worry about gene pool preservation and we also worry about cultivar line health. You should not, should not save seed from those plants that are showing obvious uh, symptomology of viral or bacterial disease. Now sometimes you may wind up saving seed that has a viral or bacterial problem because in some cases it can be latent and you can't see it, but if you can see obvious signs of uh, viral or bacterial disease in the mother plant, then it's not a very good idea to save seed from it because in many cases that disease will be transmitted through the seed and the following year when you sow your seed, you're already starting out with plants that are dirty. That is a problem that is fairly common in heirloom varieties and I know uh, in the time that you know we've worked with heirloom varieties here for probably the last seven years, it, it is not uncommon if we order in seed from even from nursery sources. Um, if we have 15 heirloom tomatoes, it's not uncommon that we have to take two of them and chuck them out the door uh, because the plants that come up uh, show obvious signs of bacterial disease even when they're still at the seedling stage inside the greenhouse. Next slide, please. Okay, the next thing we need to talk about is self-pollinated versus cross-pollinated. 
Self-pollinated means that um, the plant had um, perfect flowers with both male and female flower parts, and it was able to actually pollinate itself. That is different than when we have cross-pollination, where pollen from one individual is transferred by some mechanism to a pistil on a different individual. For seed-saving purposes, although we can collect both, it's easiest and perhaps best to start out with those crops that are self-pollinated because our likelihood of maintaining the same genetics that we're trying to do is much higher for self-pollinated than cross-pollinated plant materials. Next slide, please. Examples of, and easy is in quotation marks, but easy vegetables uh, to save seed from that are self-pollinated would include things like beans, peas, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and lettuce. In the case of beans, we'll, we're going to visit about just a couple of these. In the case of beans, if you've ever grown bees, beans in your garden, my guess is you've probably seen bees working those flowers, and we normally think about bees being involved in um, carrying pollen from one plant to another for this cross-pollination to occur. But in the case of beans, the floral parts are such that before the flower parts ever open, before the flower parts ever open, pollination has already occurred. Pollen has already been transferred from the male flower part to the stigmatic surface of the pistil. And so even though that flower may open and bees may work it later, it doesn't matter. It's already been done. The, the genetics have already been passed on that are going to be passed on. And the same is true for, for most of these. You can see bees working most of these crops. But in general, pollination has already occurred prior to whenever the bee would start to visit. There is one exception of that, uh, or, or one obvious exception to that. On tomato varieties, most modern varieties, the length of the pistil is such that it actually sits below the crown that is formed by the anthers or the male flower parts, so that modern tomato varieties, for the most part, have pistils that are short and they are below the ring that is formed by the male flower parts. So it would be impossible for a bee to come and visit that flower part to result in cross-pollination. The bee may come to visit, but as it visits, it's going to push the male flower parts down on top of the female and result in pollination with it still being self-pollinated even though a bee was present. There is an exception, though, and on some of the heirloom varieties, and also there are some environmental factors, tomatoes grown in tropical regions tend to have elongated styles, and when we have this elongated style, then we become much more worried about cross-pollination. And so then we have to take steps like uh, keeping better isolation from other varieties. If we're wanting to save variety X of tomato and we're saving it for seed and it has a long pistil, it might become important that we isolate it by itself um, and don't grow it around other tomato varieties so that we're relatively sure we're not having cross-pollination but instead having self-pollination. Next yeah, slide, Jeff, please. I, there's a couple questions there. I don't know if you want to answer them now or wait till the end of the program. On, on the crocus plant, yes, it is typically the high dollar saffron is from a specific type of crocus. The next question, are those green beans or legume type beans? Uh, yes, it is, it is beans, whether they're shell out beans like, you know, um, purple hulk cowpeas or uh, snap beans, it, it doesn't matter that group typically pollination tends to occur prior to the flower actually coming open. Does that take care? Is there more mic or have I got them? Looks like there might be one more, Jeff. Okay, I see it here. It says, is it possible or advisable to disinfect seed? Um, Let's talk about that at the very end of this, um, which there's not very many more slides, but let's 
let's wait and save that for the end. Yes, it is possible, and in some cases, yes, it is advisable, but we'll talk about that uh, as we get to uh, uh, the conclusion of this talk, if that's okay. Okay, next on the list are things which are insect pollinated, and if they're insect pollinated, then cross pollination becomes much more likely. Um, and we need to uh, have managed cross-pollination rather than uncontrolled cross-pollination so that we have, again, a known father contributor uh, as well as a known mother contributor. Examples of insect-pollinated vegetable crops would include cruciferous vegetables, things like broccoli and cabbage, and it also includes things like cucurbits, whether it's melons or pumpkins or cukes and pickles. All of those tend to be insect pollinated, and it certainly doesn't mean that we can't save seed from them. We absolutely can, but we have to take some extra steps that are uh, not necessary for those crops that we had talked about in the previous slide that are uh, self-pollinated. Next slide, please. Then third on the list would be those things that are wind pollinated. And wind pollinated are also very difficult to work with. They would include things like corn, beets, spinach, Swiss chard. There are other examples. And they certainly uh, can be crossed and seed can be saved, but they become uh, the most difficult of the groups of vegetables that we could save seeds from. For example, if you were wanting to save beet seed, they try to they try to isolate the beets that they're going to use for beet seed uh, five miles from any other beet planting. And you know, I think that would probably be a possibility in Illinois. But if you're going to try to isolate corn uh, a few miles from any other corn planting in the state of Illinois, I think that becomes a pretty a, a pretty wicked trick. So wind pollinated are, are the most difficult, and we won't spend much time talking about, you know, we're about done talking about wind pollinated things. They're much tougher and more advanced. Tomatoes tend to be self-pollinated. They require a minimum of isolation, but going back to the question that we just had from Rob, they do require some isolation, and my guess is you had them growing one next to another in very close proximity, and that's likely why you had some difficulty. Again, on those older heirloom varieties, the pistil tends to stick out beyond uh, the crown of the anthers, and so it is much more likely on those that you will have um, cross-pollination occur, uh, particularly um, uh, particularly in a garden setting if you've got them all uh, spaced relatively close one to another. Tomatoes are self-pollinated. They do uh, ideally require some isolation, uh, lots of varieties to choose from, and tomatoes is where people typically start because it's the thing that's probably most commonly grown in gardens. Next slide, please. Uh, beans, like I said, pollinate before they bloom, and in case of beans, very minimal amounts of isolation are required. Next. Cucurbits are more challenging. These are your cucumbers, your pickles, your pumpkins, those kinds of things. They are insect pollinated, and they have separate male and female flowers. It is best if we can have isolation. How do we know the difference between male and female plants. I don't think for the most part on the uh, earlier in this slide set I showed you male and female pumpkin flowers and if we were talking about uh, uh, pickles or cukes or, or others in the cucurbits it would be the same way. On the uh, in the case of a cucumber you will actually see a baby cucumber below the floral parts on a female flower if you see a flower that doesn't have that baby cucumber underneath of it, then that's going to be a male flower. Next slide, please. In the case of cucurbits, we're going to do this pollination by hand. Um, what we're going to do is come in, and when we find a female flower, which you see there's a male flower in the, in the top of this slide. On the left-hand side is the male. The right-hand side is the female. Before the female blooms, or just as it starts to open, we're going to take a known male, 
flower over and basically rub it against the female flower. As soon as we get done with that process, we need to ensure that it doesn't have any other pollen in it so we have a known cross. How do we do that? It can be done in a number of ways. Uh, the example they show here is real simple. They're just using tape and they're going to tape that flower back shut so no bees can get in there and result in additional pollen transfer. So they're going to pollinate with a male flower. As soon as they're done pollinating, they're going to tape that back shut, tape the floral parts back shut. And then there's one other thing that we need to do and that is to tag that flower and lots of times what you'll see people do is put like a bread twist tie on the stem just above uh, the uh, baby pumpkin or baby cucumber or baby whatever you're going to save. The reason that we need to put that twist tie there is you're going to walk back in this field in the fall to try to collect seed and you may have only hand pollinated 15 different flowers but there's 45 pumpkins out there. We need to make sure that we get the 15 that we hand pollinated and have a way of distinguishing them from the other 30 that are laying there. And that's real easy. You go in, you look, and you see, oh, here's my twist tie. Okay, this is one that I did, and this is one that I'm going to save. So, you know, we can still work with these uh, insect pollinated things. It's just a little more difficult. Next slide, please. Okay, we've made our crosses uh, and all those good kinds things and now it's time for seed collection process. The fruit should be harvested when fully mature. In the case of, for example, if we were going to save bell peppers, we wouldn't want to save green fruit. We would like them to actually ripen. That green fruit will turn normally red, although in some cases it will turn yellow. It depends on the genetics of the variety that you're working with. But you would allow that to actually not only become mature but actually ripen before you collected it. Um, and we would again, we talked about this earlier, we would like to do our fruit collection or our seed collection from multiple individuals, not just from a single individual. And then once we've got our fruit collected uh, and keeping track of where it came from and all those good kinds of things, then we're going to have to process that so that we actually get seed that we can work with. Next slide, please. And so on the processing, um, there's a couple of things, there's a couple of different ways depending on what it is that we're trying to process. For seeds that are embedded in fleshy fruit, things like tomatoes, for example, we would normally go through a wet processing procedure um, and that's going to involve removing the fruit from the seed and in some cases you can wash them straight away, in other cases we need to ferment them. We'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. Then once we've got them uh, cleaned, then we'd like to get them dried pretty quickly and then we're going to store them in a proper place once we've got them dried down. For seed that is coming from something that is relatively dry, uh, for example, you're going to save seed from beans or peas or those kinds of things, then we would undergo a dry processing, which simply means we're going to let the plant dry out. We're not going to pick green beans that we're going to save from seed. We don't pick them when they're green. We allow them to hang on the plant uh, until the fruit pod itself becomes relatively dry. At that point, we, we refer to it as being dehiscent but you rub it and the thing will actually come apart. And when we do dry processing, we normally have seeds that are pretty easy uh, to get out, but oftentimes we'll have some chaff and duff and other kinds of things that are with the seed that we try to clean out of it prior to storage. And then uh, once we get the debris and the seed separated, uh, then we also go through uh, practicing good storage technique. Next slide, please. For wet processing, which would be, you know, moist fruits, again, you know, tomatoes is sort of the classic example. Uh, we would like to stay on the plant just a little bit beyond the ferment, I mean, a little bit beyond the normal eating stage. Then if we could go to the next slide, please. And so you're going to bring your tomato that you've saved for seed into the house. You're going to cut it and you're going to sweet, squeeze uh, the fruit and run that uh, gelatinous material that's contained inside the ovule 
there's some jelly and seed together. And what we will often do is run it in the mason jar like you see up above. And if we could go to the next slide, please. And if you look, here's two mason jars. Uh, we're going to add a little bit of water once we've run the pulp into the mason jar. And we're just going to let it hang out for, uh, I don't know, three or four days. And if you look, we've got two mason jars here. The one on the left is one that has just had seed and pulp squeezed into it with a little bit of water added to it. The one on the right is after it's undergone a three or four day fermentation process. You can see that the, the stuff has cleared. The liquid has become more clear. Um, I'll be honest with you, the liquid doesn't smell better. It'll smell a little bit worse than it did when we started. Um, but we've got the seed in a pretty good pretty good state at that point. We would then you know, pour that back through like the screen colander that we had seen in the previous slide. Hey, good job, whoever did that. Pour that back through that screen colander and rinse it off, and we now have viable seed. Um, let's go ahead for it again. One more quick, oh, go back one. Perfect. Uh, one of the things when you go and you don't really pour all of that liquid straight away into the colander. The first part of it you'd like to pour off, and because uh, you'd like to pour off without going through the colander. If we have a tomato plant, you know, and it may have, you know, whatever, let's just for argument's sake say there's 500 seed in there. Well, 450 of those seed may be good, but 50 of them may not be sound. And what we typically find is that the not sound seed, that which is not going to be viable, for the most part will actually float. And sound seed sinks, uh, poor seed floats. And so we can pour that off before we dump it into the screen colander. Once we've poured off the initial top liquids, kind of skimmed it, if you will, and gotten rid of the, the seeds that were duds, uh, then we pour it back in the colander and, and rinse it off. Go ahead to the next slide then. Uh, dry, dry processing, uh, again, these are for things like you know beans, peas, those kinds of things. Let the pods stay on until mature, dry if possible. And you can take small amounts and thresh them by hand. As you read through books, they'll talk about winnow, W-I-N-N-O-W. And that simply means using you know, wind of some kind or air movement of some kind, either compressed air or you know, air from a fan or some way to separate the um, chaff from the viable seed. And again, then we're going to allow this to dry. Next slide, please. Once we've got our seed collected, whether it is um, whether it was processed through the wet method or the dry method, we've gotten our seed dry. It's now time to store it. And a kind of a general rule of thumb is for seed storage, the sum of the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit plus the relative humidity should be near 80 degrees. Or sh I'm sorry, should be near a total of 80. So that means something like 40 degrees temperature and 40% relative humidity, or 45 degree temperature and 35% rel relative humidity. We would like those totals to typically equal somewhere around 80. I'm sure you guys, some of you have seen shows where they talk about uh, germplasm preservation. And yes, we can save seed for a much longer period of time if we hold them, at least most seed, in sub-zero conditions. But my guess is most of you don't have sub-zero freezers, nor do I think it's really very uh, practical for uh, purposes of gardening or, or even market gardens to store their seed in that fashion. We just like to store them somewhere where it is relatively dry and relatively cool. It means that we don't want to store them. For example, if we have a greenhouse where we're going to be planting them, and that greenhouse is going to be 90 degrees, what are actual temperature conditions for sub-zero storage? Uh, some of that stuff they will actually store as cold as um, uh, minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on different germplasm preservation groups will store different materials, but it's quite a degree below zero. Um, oh, back to the storage condition. If we've got a greenhouse, you know, that's going to be 90 degrees in it, or we're going to put our seed in our garage where it's going to be 90 degrees, that's not really a very good storage place. Uh, we would like to have some place a little bit cooler. 
Conversely, uh, a basement may not be a great spot either. It may be a little bit cooler, but you wind up having really, really high relative humidities in a musky basement in some cases. And so we don't want either of those two extremes. We don't want really high relative humidity, nor do we want really high relative temperature. In all cases, viability declines with time, but if you provide poor storage conditions, that viability will decline at a much more rapid rate. Next slide, please. And the last thing to bear in mind is that once you've got your seed saved, even if you're storing it in a good fashion, it is only good for a finite period of time, and that how long seed is viable for is largely a function of uh, what the species is that we're dealing with. So while sweet corn is likely only viable for uh, no more than two years and preferably only one year, things like tomatoes can be saved successfully for as long as 10 years. So um, once you've saved your seed, if you don't consume it all the first year, in general that's not a problem. Most of these things can be used uh, for more than one year, uh, but don't keep them beyond the seed longevity. Very good, very good. So we're at the end of the slide. So let's go back and, and visit. Somebody asked about is it possible or advisable to disinfect seeds? Yeah, there's a couple of ways you can do this. In some cases you can use uh, things like um, sodium hypochlorite on tomatoes for surface disinfestation of the seed, which will get rid of any bacteria that would be sitting on the seed coat, for example. But it won't do anything for the case of bacterial diseases that are actually inside of the seed proper. And in those cases, there are uh, some situations where we can actually use hot water and soak those seeds in hot water at a pretty specific temperature. Uh, in other words, a, a temperature that's going to be plus or minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit for a, again, very fixed amount of time. Um, and that varies from species to species in terms of what temperature and what length of time that we're going to use. But there are a lot of commercial growers who, even when they buy seed from commercial seed houses, will, for example, hot water treat their seed, their tomato seed, prior to planting uh, in, in efforts to try to reduce the amount of bacterial disease they see in their production mm -hmm. field. Um, you can save uh, fruit from frost damage, I'm sorry, you can save seed from frost damaged fruit, absolutely not a problem, as long as that fruit was mature enough prior to it becoming frost damaged that the seed inside of it was fully developed and, and viable. The, the damage of the frost itself on the fruit shouldn't have any impact on the seed proper. Uh, let's see what else we got. Can seeds be saved? from overripe fruit like rotting melons, absolutely, and in fact, it's probably better to save fruit from, uh, we would rather have it overripe than underripe. Is hot water treatment a form of pasteurization? Not to the best of my knowledge, it's a little bit different than that. It's a case where we're just differentially trying to not kill the germ of the embryo, the germination of the embryo inside the plant, but we're trying to hold it at a temperature that all but kills that germination in hopes that it will result in killing the bacteria without killing um, the, uh, the embryo proper. Favorite book or resource on this information, there's a Seed Savers Handbook that has got tons of this information in it, uh, and it's a pretty good resource. Uh, in terms of sort of looking at the different kinds of groups and how you would go about saving seed. Beyond that, for the plant pathology side of things like how to hot water treat, uh, I don't know that I have a good favorite resource. I just have uh, that information from a couple of different sources in a notebook I keep here. Is there a simple test to determine seed dryness? Not really. Um, but most people don't worry very much about um, the exact percent dryness of the seed. Normally, for example, if you are taking your tomatoes, you've gone through the fermentation process, you skimmed it off, you rinsed the remaining seed, that normally will go on like, I don't know, the most farmers I've seen just put it on a, 
the screen out of a destroyed storm door from somewhere on the farm and let it sit around uh, in a garage or a greenhouse for four or five days until the seed becomes good and dry. In some cases, if you've got a pretty big mound of seed, you may need to go through and stir it because the center of the pile won't get dry. Uh, and then once the seed has gotten dried down, I think for the most part it's suitable for storage. If you're wanting to store seed for very long periods of time, uh, if you're wanting to store seed for four or five years, then we'll talk about putting it in something like a desiccating chamber, which is typically you know like a mason jar that's got uh, silica or some other kind of desiccant that draws the moisture out of the air. Is the a significant danger passing disease around a community by saving seeds? Yeah, probably so. Um, but in many cases, in many cases, these diseases are relatively common anyway. I mean, I don't think, I don't think there's a uh, risk of bringing a brand new disease into a community, generally speaking, by using save seed, but the likelihood uh, of having bacterial or viral infested plants from amateur seed collectors as opposed to seed nurseries probably is a little bit greater. Uh, next, is a fuller seed better than a skinny one? Yes, in general that is true and the same even on the vegetative kinds of things. If you look at, if you plant, for example, a small garlic clove and a big garlic clove side by side, almost always you get better results from the larger garlic clove that you set. Um, yeah, the, the fatter, plumper seed likely will have better seedling vigor and that will likely translate into um, better performance in the field. Can you tell which plants like squash or pumpkins will not cross pollinate? All of the squash and pumpkins will cross pollinate. Can I use a simple food dehydrator to dry seed? Yes, you don't even have to be that elaborate, but yes, you can. Can the average, oh yeah, I was supposed to start that out. I was going to ask how many of you have been saving seedless grape seed. Can the average gardener grow seedless watermelon? I understand it is very difficult. The average gardener can, in fact, grow seedless watermelon, but with seedless watermelon, like if when you buy the, you know, that's not seed you're going to save. That's going to be seed you have to purchase. And when you purchase it, normally in the seed packet, there's going to be um, uh, five seeds, for example, that are one color and one seed that is a different color. That one seed that is a different color is a pollinizer, it's a pollen source, it doesn't give rise to seedless melons. Uh, you have to make sure that the pollinizer makes it up and germinates and gets out in the garden with your other seedless plants. Uh, and additionally, the toughest part of growing seedless watermelon is they're very difficult to get to germinate, um, but can the average gardener do it? Absolutely. There's one question up there about how long seed banks last. Uh, seed bank sowing seed, how long do they keep, how does it work? Most seed banks, um, it, there's a great deal of variability on how it works. A lot of times the germplasm preservation may be associated or a seed bank may be associated with a specific species. Um, in general, those seed banks that I have seen, uh, they maintain quantities of seed for as long as uh, even longer than 10 year periods of time. Periodically they will take samples out and germinate them to make sure that the seed that they are saving is still viable. At the point when they feel they no longer uh, have really great viability, then they will likely take that germplasm out and plant it out the following growing season, harvest new seed to renew their germplasm that they're preserving, and restart the clock and put that back into uh, their storage conditions at their seed bank. There was one question at the end here about uh, references for seed saving handbook. Oh, I, if you just Google seed savers handbook, it should come up. There's a question about how far apart should two different kinds of squash be planted. I'm assuming 
this is from Shirley Townsend, I'm assuming you want those two squash to pollinate? Or just question maybe try not to let those two squash plants pollinate so you can save the seed from both of them. I do want to thank Jeff Kindheart. <coughs> uh, and Jeff, I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but Jeff is a senior research specialist with the University of Illinois Dixon Springs uh, Ag Center down in extreme southern Illinois. And he's been a valuable resource for us uh, on the crop system, on the uh, small farm local foods team providing information to local growers. Oh, Jeff, she did provide uh, further uh, response if you want to answer that. Yeah, it, you know, when you when you look at manuals on squash, they're going to say that somewhere between a quarter or a half mile is required uh, from um, one site to another. But with that said, there is a way around all of that, and that is by you taking care of it by controlling the pollination yourself. When you see the flower that you're, you know, I've got two different varieties and I'm wanting to save seed from both of them, you make sure that that flower, the female flowers that you're wanting, the first time that they're open and their stigmatic surface is receptive, you take care of the pollination yourself and then again take that back shut so that you control the cross pollination and at that point it doesn't eliminate but it reduces the need for segregation and in all likelihood you're going to be just fine without having the quarter mile separation, which isn't really very realistic for anyone other than uh, commercial nurseries. So, you know, you can get by with that um, by controlling when the pollination occurs. Next question is up here, how many individuals will it create? That varies a little bit from uh, plant material to plant material. On corn, for example, I think they would talk about collecting seed from no fewer than 100 individuals. In the case of tomatoes, you're probably looking at uh, 10 individuals in order to ensure that you're not just selecting uh, a specific local um, archetype, but instead maintaining the, the uh, genetic deeper gene pool that was associated with the variety to begin with. What about protecting corn from unwanted airborne GMO pollination? All I can say to that is good luck. Uh, I don't know how you would go about doing that. Corn pollen moves an awful long way and there's an awful lot of uh, GMO material. So I don't know in the state of Illinois if that is, if the only way you could do it is one of the ways that you can control pollination is that we will put on things called pollination sacks. As soon as you first start to see the silk sticking out of the bag, you can cover those silks with a brown paper bag, which precludes any pollen from getting in. You then go and get the mail, the tassel that you want. You remove the sack once a day and pollinate it. In the case of corn, pollination may have to occur across more than one day because new silks are being produced. So you may have to unbag and rebag that, but that would be the way you would go about keeping any pollen source other than the one you wanted from contacting the silk. Anyway, I, I thank you for your time. Um, the problem in these sorts of things you know, there's an awful lot of genetics that need to be talked about and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, but anyway, I hope you found this to be a useful sort of beginning overview for seed collecting. Uh, I, again, appreciate your time. Uh, I've got another question that, that popped up here uh, that says, is there a preference for types of containers and or material in which the seeds are stored? Not to the best of my knowledge, uh, you typically see them stored in uh, plastic pill bottles or a common thing that you will see seeds stored in for uh, smaller type seeds. Uh, paper bags are pretty commonplace for uh, larger kinds of things. If you're going to use paper, we need to make sure that the environment we're keeping it in is one where uh, it's, it's very dry. For example, if I was going to store seed in a, in a, uh, a refrigerator, uh, then I wouldn't use paper for fear that that paper might get wet and transfer that moisture to the seed inside. So if it was going to be in a refrigerator, uh, probably something plastic and more waterproof would be better. But, uh, you know, a variety of materials could be usable. So anyway, with that, again, thank you so much for your time, and I hope you all have a great evening.
Um, we thank everybody for, for listening today. Thanks again, everyone.